forget, you can hear the full-length, longer version wherever you get your podcasts. I could say that the whole reason for starting this a few years ago could culminate in today when I get to sit down and talk to Joanna Lumley. <laughs> That's the best intro I've ever had. Well, it's sincere because this is a this is a thrill. You. You can't meet many people who aren't pleased to see you, I would have thought. That's because I approach with such a huge grin with my great teeth flashing like a horse <laughs> and have done that all my life. So I think that one's public, that, that people who, who, who don't know me but meet me will only have seen me smiling or being silly or being yes. foolish or being funny yes. or sometimes being brave and saving the world. But generally it's a kind of goodish vibe from the stuff that they would see on television. And actually I love people anyway, so I, I find it nice when they like me back. Did the move into doing stuff, more stuff as yourself, what prompted that? Uh, very easily. Um, a, a group beautifully named Warner Sisters Quite a small English um, production company. We're making a film about the Brook family who ran the country, which used to be Sarawak, um, simply because I'd been brought up as a child in Malaysia. Mm. Sarawak is now part of Malaysia. Um, and knew the, the kind of customs and a bit of the pronunciation, had a feeling for the place, and they thought I'd be a good presenter of that show. So I did it and absolutely loved it. It was what adventurous. What did you love about it? I loved the adventurous nature of it. We went mm. right into the heart where there were no roads. You had to go upriver by pole, in little boats and sleep in longhouses under shrunken heads. But when you began, was, was it the 1960s that you yeah. you came through? Well, in? the 70s really in acting. Right. In the 60s I was modelling. Yeah. From 64 to about 67, I, I was 68, I was I was a fashion model, actually, uh, in London, in swinging in London then, Rob. It's lovely. I, was I mean, that a... age is presented to us as such a magical time, uh, Beatles and this and mm. that and mm. swinging London. Mm. The is, is it accurately spoken of, do you think? It, uh, I think, you know, distance lending enchantment mm. and rose-coloured spectacles and everything and slightly losing out of the fact that half the time you were quite poor or very afraid of doing something or nervous or just on edge all the time. But it was, f it had the freedom of not being recorded. So there was not people filming you or m listening to you all the time. You could sort of park your car on the streets, which didn't seem to have red lines, yellow lines, zigzag lines, all these things, parking meters. I can remember parking meters coming in. So before then, if you had a car, which you usually didn't, because London was virtually free of cars, mm. these tiny side roads were empty because people went and caught a, caught a bus or caught the tube, as I did as a model. So it was a very different place. And if a nightclub opened, there was one called, I think it was Sibylla's which opened. And I mean, apart from the four tops being there, I think... Um, the Stones were there. I think maybe the Who, the Kinks, the Beatles. Those sort of people went to nightclubs, pitched up, danced, dated people, left, drove themselves home or was, fell into taxis and things. But nobody recorded it. There was, wasn't this obsession mm. for looking at ourselves doing things. So in that way, it was freer and nicer, I think. Mm. I th or different. Um, nobody could have dreamed of ordering takeaway food. <sighs> Because it was so, well, there wasn't any, but also well, how expensive. Most of us were pretty skinned. And, and the, the diet then uh, was not, nothing, a world away from now. A I world mean, away. It was British, straightforward oh, food. That was it? not quite, but that was almost when olive oil was stuff you <laughs> bought in Boots the Chemist for earache. Is that right? Yes, in tiny little bottles. <laughs> so if they'd said to you, <laughs> go, go forward some years, you'll be putting this on lots of the stuff you eat. Well, uh, luckily, that was when I was at school, school years in the 50s. But by the time the 60s came, with it came this great change in, in eating habits, Italians, particularly in London. That and was the 60s. That was the 60s. Right. And these great trattoria started and the, the trattoria. Yes. And uh, the spaghetti and mm -hmm. sauces and garlic mm -hmm. and everything was chic and lovely. And people like Roman Polanski and mm. Sharon Tate and... Mm. Um, Jack Nicholson and things pitched up at these restaurants. Rudolf Nureyev would be eating across there. It was quite normal. Now you'll never see that. Literally, you'll never see that. People as famous as that 
No, I don't think you see Beyonce much. Not often. I mean, if I ask her, she pops in. But if you don't see Beyonce sitting in no, the Wolseley anymore... No, because everything, uh, all those people are separated, aren't they? Yeah. Uh, you know, so if you're at an event, they'll be in a separate area, but just in life generally, the, uh, the, the two do, do this, not overlap. It's not much overlap. more divided society. Yes. And in the 60s, the good thing about the 60s was that it was considered quite vulgar to have money and if you have it, had it to say anything about it. So if you had money, you quietly paid for things. Yeah. But you never went about... Like that. And clothes were just gorgeous clothes. Or if you didn't have gorgeous clothes, you made them gorgeous. You yeah. made stuff, you wrapped stuff around, you cut things off. I always say, and um, correct me if, if I'm wrong, that in the 70s, mm. I remember, so I was born in 65, so I grew up in the 70s. My initial pop culture heroes were in the 70s. And they would flaunt their wealth if they'd bought a yeah. Rolls Royce or, or a, a fur coat or whatever. Yeah. And that I see that in, in the world of, in my limited knowledge of the world of rap music now. Yes, yes. So did, did you witness that change? That change, I think so, because it was kind of, it was kind of when the Beatles broke up, you know, and the flower power thing yeah. sad, suddenly died. You pulled back the curtains and it was just ash outside. You know, it hadn't kind of... the. It hadn't worked. The world was not brothers, you know, united in sweetness and peace and light and <laughs> just dancing and all those things. Yeah. People kind of, half of us really believed that if you if you were really kind and wanted something enough and were kind enough, that it would work. And uh, I don't know, it just sort of vanished away. Money came back. Money, which quite often causes... You know, it brings comfort and happiness at mm. one degree, but a bit of it further up that it divides people off mm. more mm. and more. And now more than ever. Now more than ever. You might say. Can I approach you as an almost zelig like figure? You you're <laughs> familiar with Zelig. I sure am. Okay, and if you're have... not, Google it. Um so you mentioned the Beatles. Yeah. Joanna Lumley's encounters with the Beatles, either as a collective or as individuals discuss? Separately. First of all, I went with my flatmates to the Hammersmith Odeon, which is what it was called then, when the Beatles were playing the mop-top lads from Liverpool. And the warm-up act was Freddie and the Dreamers mm -hmm. and Sounds Incorporated. And whoever was hosting, and I can't remember who it was, would run on in a Beatles wig and everybody would scream thinking it was going to be the Beatles next. And yeah. It was... Utterly extraordinary. They were so, so fabulous, but I never met them. Later on, I met... I never met John Lennon. I met Ringo and I met uh, George and I met Paul. Um, and actually, I read at Linda's memorial service, so I got to know Paul and Linda a bit. Um, I sat next door in a cinema when they when there was a, the, the kind of preview of the film, not Help, it was A Hard Day's Night or something like that. I went into a cinema in Soho to see it. I knew some photographers who could come along. Sat in the darkness next to somebody here and watched it all the way through. And we were in those days we were very cool about everything. When the lights came on, I saw it was John Lennon. But I was too cool to say that was fantastic. <laughs> you just went, you know, sort of like fantastic. <laughs> just don't, couldn't, couldn't say it. Couldn't bring yourself to be uncool. The other thing we talk about the Beatles is we look at the Beatles now from where we are now. But watching them in that that at the Hammersmith Odeon, yeah. they weren't the Beatles with the with the cultural significance that we put on them now. They were fab. They were the top pop. They group. were the new yeah. huge yeah. thing. Yeah. But there would be no thought of what they were to become and the evolution they went through. No, and although we knew the songs were going to change rock music, pop music forever, yeah. we didn't quite know how much. No. We no. didn't know how good they were either, yeah. because it's ho horrible to say this, but not a lot com com comes up to that standard. No. But I mean, but those are the days of the Everly Brothers and the Beach Boys and Elvis not far before and uh, uh, Paul Simon and people like this, giants, then Elton John came along. So the giants have walked along the yeah. same path. Yeah. But um, I think partly because you're old. Rob, look, is it just me, but do you think, I think, because now I'm old, that pop, sort of pop music is kind of for the young. I know a lot of people say, oh, no, we we just, you know, you always get politicians pretending they're raving to some band they've just picked mm. off a secretary's desk and looked at. Um, I think it's for the young and I think it's for falling in love and I think it's for dreaming the world will be yours. And 
And I think that's that's it's that's a time for pop it's music. It's like it's like another country, isn't it? When, when, when I've drifted like away from it. I couldn't love music more. Yeah. And sometimes when I hear it, I feel people say, "You must listen to this. It's great." And you can put on special granny acceptance listening face, uh-huh. and even even might do a bit of Theresa May kind of boogieing, trying to get down with it. You know what I mean? But actually, <laughs> truth. But that's as it should be. I, I think so because it's yeah, for the young. Exactly because it's and it's going like that, yeah. and it's looking out, and anything is yeah. possible. I was looking through the the, the CV isn't the right word. Uh, I was looking through and seeing the, these uh, these kind of seminal British shows that that you you popped up in mm. on your way. Uh, are you being served? Yeah. Who, what did you play in that? I played it in it twice. Um, my ex-husband uh, uh, wrote it. Of and course, Jeremy I didn't Lloyd. Make that connection. Yes, and yes. he could see I was absolutely skint and out of work, and so he gave me the part of of a German customer at some stage. Really? And then also, I was somebody who was promoting some new scent. I can't remember what it was, but I did that. I did step turn some. Yeah. I did on the buses. I did the cuckoo walls. I did think. Um, I did things where I was somebody's girlfriend. I was usually somebody's girlfriend. Right. Yeah. 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 And that was all yeah. it was. Yeah. And then what was it then? Because the the first thing I think of is the new Avengers. Was that was that the first sort thing the first, where you were front and center? Sort of. By that time, I'd done a Dracula film. I'd been on Coronation Street. I'd yeah. done all kinds of things. Yeah. But only, Coronation Street was eight episodes. One month's work. Yeah, Dracula film was the last film ever. Christopher Lee. Yeah, that's right. And uh, Peter Cushing did together. Hammer House of Horror. You know, two hundred quid. Well done, you. You know that kind of thing. It was fine. It didn't... So now we're in the nineteen seventies. That would have been seventies, even up to the eight... yes, nineteen seventies. Sorry, early seventies. And I got the part of of Purdy in the New Avengers, and that was hard fought because they were looking for you know through lots and lots of girls to do it. And the best thing that could have happened to me, because although the pay was lousy and it was a buyout forevermore, oh. mm, but that didn't matter because uh, I was working with top English actors all the time. The mm. guest artists were wonderful. Patrick um, McNee and Gareth Hunt, favourite people in the world, the kindest and funniest men to work with, and f- all working on films. So it was the equivalent of doing 13 feature films mm. in two years. Were they bought out as well, or were you bought out because you were Gareth and I, new? I think, were bought out. Pat was had been in there before and had been yeah, negotiated his contract. And later he went back when he could see that we had nothing. We were so poor from it. But anyway, I then did Saffron Steel with the great just departed yeah, David McCallum. Know, yeah, yeah, and yeah, that yeah. was the first time I, my bank balance stopped coming in in red writing. Really? At first that time. point? Yeah. Interesting, isn't it? And you, were, how long were you with Jeremy Lloyd for? Who, for people who about, don't know, was part of a about right twenty minutes. We, oh, we were really? married for eight months. Really? Yeah, V fast. You, you do things fast. I met him and married him in two weeks. No. Yes, we did things like that before you were born. <laughs> no, actually, you you were born. Nineteen sixty-five. Yes, but I was still. You were only little, tiny. I was little. You were tiny. Little, um, little beard. Little chap, there I was in South <laughs> Wales trying to grow a little beard. And you know what? Mm. We One of our dogs, when I was a kid, well, when I was a teenager, we had the Yorkshire Terrier and mm. called it Purdy. Did you? Named after your Purdy? character. Oh, yes. I'm so touched. Yes. Was it a nice dog? Terrible dog. Oh, was it? No, it was. She, she was. She was. <laughs> she, she was very nice. We've we've gone off from Jennifer Saunders. Yes. How Jennifer, did how did she Jennifer. come into your life? Well, because um, she's been a big part. Huge. She was in French and Saunders, and we all saw and roared with laughter. She was in Girls on. Did I you ever guest on. on French and Saunders? No. Right. Okay. Um, and th- the script came through, and there it was. One of the funniest things I've ever seen. And I was thought, it written for you? No. Oh. It was just a script. All right. And there was no indication of what Patsy was like or who she was. There were no descriptions or anything. There were words written down. To, you know. Um, she wasn't thinking of you when she wrote it. No. Oh. It's now, we've now got sort of slightly muddled stories because Aid Edmondson always said that it was, he, well, that he suggested me. Yeah. Um, I was on a Ruby Wax show. Ruby suggested that she suggested me. Jennifer has now said that she thinks she saw me on the Ruby Wax show and thought I'd be good. It doesn't matter. I hadn't met her. I saw the script. I thought it was fantastic. I was taken to the BBC to meet her and to do a little read through of a scene where I have to say that either I did it so badly or she was so uncommunicative that I was certain she didn't like me. I went back home and said to my agent, I love the script, but I have to say you must get me out of this because she's too polite to say she doesn't like me. And I didn't think I can do it. She doesn't want me. She doesn't know how to say it. no. And my agent said, just do it. It's a pilot. Who knows? It might not work. 
So we did it. That was the pilot. And at the pilot were Dawn and Lenny and... Um, Oh, I, I'm trying to think of, of all, 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 I mean, anybody, Aid was there and Rick and, um, you know, the heavyweights yeah. of the comedy thing yeah. were all there watching the pilot. Yeah. And then we knew it was going to be a success. Not how much a success. We thought that maybe people would enjoy it in the south of England where they knew what Harvey Nicks was. Uh -huh. Yeah. But when it went across the world, it was extraordinary. That's interesting, isn't it? Because that conjures up the sort of thing you might get in notes, which is, yeah, you know, being very specific with Harvey Nicks, that, that's not going to play no. outside of so-and-so. But it's all about being specific. Isn't it it's lovely? It's all about detail all the time. And people who feel outside of it kind of want to know what it yeah. was. We watched cowboy films when we were young. Mm, We'd mm. never been to America. We'd yeah. never been to the far. We'd never been in those times. But we knew what a lariat was or where yeah. Boot Hill was. I always think of that with, with something like The Simpsons, which will have... A lot of pop culture references, some of them that are very parochial to America. Yeah. But you understand of this. You, do. You, you know it from the rhythm, you know it from I So know. did you and, and this now is this this is an out and out comic part and it became a celebrated comic mm -hmm. performance mm -hmm. with impersonators. I think it was all of us there. I think the show was celebrated. Yes, 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 it was. But yeah. but you as much, if not more, than than everyone. How did that did it, did it change your life or were you, by that point, you're already part of the furniture, so... Well, it, it, it was just such utter heaven to do something which makes people laugh. There's something irreplaceably... So you can observe the difference then in having been in straight stuff mm. or... Uh, and then the the difference, because you were saying earlier on about when people see you, they, they're very pleased to see you. Yes. Because there are these associations. With laughter. Yeah. And f fun and, and kindness. And even though Patsy and Eddie were pretty revolting women, <laughs> they were funny. And yeah. when people are funny, you can kind of get away with anything. And Jennifer's writing and additions from Ruby Wax, but Jennifer principally created episode after episode where Patsy was allowed to grow because Jennifer's very generous mm. and she would write in more and more for Patsy, yeah. more and more extraordinary things that Patsy had been a man. That she'd <laughs> had, you know, Patsy had been, had been a, sort of abandoned by her mother when she was tiny and brought up really as a, as a kind of a Euro trash creature. Yeah. Nobody knew how old she was. She'd had all her organs removed. I mean, we went on. She became more and more extreme. Yeah. She'd become a cartoon character. And it was more and more heaven to play. Yeah, yeah. And you did the... You did a, <clears throat> um, how many movies have you done of it? One, one. movie? One, one movie. Mm. All sorts of guest appearances. Guest, masses of guest appearances on the movie. But you know, Rob, what it's like when you do a television show which you rehearse and play live in front of an yeah. audience. Yeah. It's very different from doing a movie where... Half the people you, or scenes, you, you're, no, you're not there. Mm. You don't meet those people. Mm. You don't see them. Mm. And it's only when the final film comes up that you see what it is. So you don't have the same bonding with a film mm. as mm. we did with our cast over the That's 20 the odd years. It's the great part of a series, isn't it? Oh, it's, it's it, magic. When, when it's an ensemble like you had. Yeah. Of, of, uh, and it's all beautifully cast. And let's not forget when it's a hit because yeah. that's a lovely yeah. thing. It's just a great experience. Yes, it's magic. To, to, to be with those people. And Jennifer was so casual about the whole thing. At one stage, I think we didn't do it for five years because she, she couldn't be bothered to write it or got ideas about She's something She's famously else. Uh, a procrastinator, isn't yes, she? She's she is. famously last minute. And I read that uh, Dawn's Dawn... Dawn's the only one who knows that she puts some money on the table. Dawn had been a teacher for a while, and, and, and so she's organised. But Jennifer will leave it all to the last minute. That's right. And Dawn lures her out with promises of great wealth. <laughs> <laughs> but Jam in Jerusalem, I thought, was a quite stunning show. Mm. Adorable great about cast, the Women's Institute. Great cast. Fabulous now, cast. Now, remind us, my friend David Mitchell was in that, wasn't he? was he? in that, but almost every Patrick Barlow was in it as well, but it was yeah. quite a large amount of women, as you can Sue, imagine. Sue um, Johnson? Sue Johnson was in it. I played a terrifically old woman called Delilah Stagg, who could remember Hitler. <laughs> she, was, she was great admirer of Hitler. And I got some very bad teeth, false teeth, because I love a bit of a prop. I love a bit of a false nose, you know. This little teeth. And, um, and a very, very wiggy old strange hair. And Delilah went about being impossible, hardly doing anything, but bicycling so slowly people could walk past her. I I thought it was funny. I was hardly in it. Right. But it was a great right. privilege. And I thought the show was wonderful. And idiots, and I'm afraid there are idiots in charge of our lives, Rob, mm -hmm. pulled it because they sort of said, oh, I don't think this is going anywhere. I don't know why they did that. I always think it's funny when someone has had as big success as, say, uh, Jennifer has. Mm. 
that why they're not then just basically just giving a blank cheque? They used you, to do no, that in you the old Clearly, days. you know what you're doing. People you like Lou Grade say, I don't understand a word of it, off you go and make it. Yes. Now they've all got to, to sit around in little committees yes. and everybody's got their own little idea and I'm being hateful now. I'll, I'll probably never be employed again now. But the truth is that there, that there's a different, the freedom of creation mm-hmm. has been much different. Stamped. Well, everybody's got an opinion now, and and you know whether it's people on social media or oh, Lordy with uh, incredibly strong opinions about things, and it's right the way up to um, to making creative things. So, so you got to cherish. Some people manage to hang on to that autonomy, manage to hang on to yeah. that. Right. Well, I'm going to make it. I'm going to make it. Let's just leap about a bit now mm. that I mentioned Martin Scorsese. You had that. One scene, I think it was, in The Wolf of Wall Street. How did that come about? What's the story there? The script came to me and it had that very attractive... I, I, when I say how did that come about... No, that I know, it's just, a little you, bit harsh. Know. I felt... I just, <laughs> I just let it bounce past. No, but like you understand... I know, you, I mean, I was going to tell you the true story, which is which was why you were actually... Your, your amazement is justified. <laughs> I think it was... He, first of all, I think this is the story. He wanted Julie Andrews to do it. And Julie had just had that throat oh, operation, yes, so yes, she didn't yes, want to do it. Yes. Then they thought of getting an English actress, and they sent it to Eileen Atkins, yes. who was very busy doing probably Doc Martin or something, yes. and couldn't break her contract to do it. Yes. And then it came to me. So I want, although I want, and I now pretend boasty to people and say, oh, you know, Leo had seen me and adored me, Marty admired me forever. It's That's not strictly true, but... Um, they send you the script. We do it now in England, but in those days, only American scripts would come with your name printed yeah. diagonally in grey across it yeah. on every single page. Yeah. You go, they want me in their film, and this is my script. So you say, I just said yes. I saw the thing, and I said yes. They said, you want to read through it? And I said, well, yes, okay. They said, read, find the scene, find the scene. I said yes. And they said, no, look, look, look at the screen. Kiss Leo DiCaprio, and you go, yes, 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 I love it. Yes, I'd love to do this. I think I can fit it in. I apologise for saying, "How did you?" That, that's I, 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 I'm, I'm in the Barbie film, Barbie and there's a fair it, yeah. number of people who said, "What's he doing in the Barbie film?" So I, so I know <laughs> that. Don't laugh. I haven't seen it. Don't cackle. I haven't seen Don't it. Cackle like I want a witch to see at my it. Misfortune. No, I want to see it. You're laughing even more now. Do you feel that what? you? Do you feel that you were Ken? Did you I feel- was a Ken. Were you? I was Sugar Daddy Ken. What in bar- in the Barbie film? Girlfriend, this is what I'm telling you. Yes. <gasps> if we can make it less about you and more about I me, didn't know I this am right. in, in Barbie. Oh my and God. some reaction on social media was, what the hell is he doing in Barbie? Which was a little bit of my reaction then to you what the hell are you? Exactly. exactly. And so I what I'm saying is, is I understand can't. and I didn't mean. No. But yes, I'm in it. Did you did you work with with Ken and uh, with um? With Ken's R- not a real person, no, of course. Isn't with Ryan Gosling and my Margot Robbie I who was w- in Wolf of Wall Street. I worked with your dear dear friend Margot. Did you? I did work with your dear dear friend Margot. She's pretty gorgeous, isn't she? She's a very impressive person mm. all round because mm. she's got the business head as well. Oh, has she? Well, she's produced the film. Oh yeah. my god. Yeah, really impressive. When we did The Wolf of Wall Street, Margot, I know you won't mind me saying this, she was quite a new part, I mean, she was quite new, mm. new kid on the block. Mm. And um, it was Christmas, sort of Christmas time, November, coming into December. Um, and she made me out of dough. You know when you make flour and water together and you can mould it into a shape and it dries as hard as yes. porcelain? Yes. And coloured it. She made a J and did it with candy stripes on it, painted it. Wow. And put in a little with a little loop on it for my Christmas tree. Wow. And gave it to me as a little Christmas present. How lovely. Well, I can categorically tell you I didn't get anything like that. Made by Margot Robbie. She, she's grown out of that sort of stuff now. I got nothing. <laughs> it wasn't Christmas time when you did it. What was Scorsese like to work with? Immaculate. He's got he's a he's got a great sense of allergy about many things. So he's allergic to dust, pollen, oh. insects. Air, light, travel, all kinds of things. He dresses immaculately, um, incredibly smiley, always smiling and generous and open to people, but like some fabulous hustled emperor, always being taken from somewhere into somewhere. And on the sets, there would be there was a sort of green room for the stars. Um, this is sort of, you said one scene, you rather diminished my part. I was at the wedding 
and I was at the scene in the park. And I, I remember the, the park the scene. Yes, well, I did. Do, I was at the wedding scene, which was a whole day. Of did you have much to do in that scene? Because I don't remember look, you in no, that scene. I, look, I was in it. Are you the camera sure came. You were? The camera showed me in it, and also I had a little word with Leo on the dance floor. Oh, when she said, "Oh, look, it's Aunt Emma, Margot Robbie, mm-hmm. your so-called co-star, who you claim to know." Ran across to me if you'd known her oeuvre of work, you'd have known this. Ran across at Aunt Emma, and then she said, "Um, um, what was his name? Jordan, Jordan, Jordy, come here, Aunt Emma." And he came over, and he had white stuff on his nose, oh. and I went dust, dust, dust because I knew that it was cocaine, yeah. and then said something cute and funny, which I can't remember. So I was in that as well. But Scorsese was a magician. He was a darling man. But he did live in the inner, inner, inner sanctum. And so from the green room, you'd go to this thing. You'd have to be taken by an assistant. Then you'd be held in a keeping bay. Then somebody would say, Mr. Scorsese will now see you. So when he asked me to come and see him, because he wanted to talk to me about my travelling to the Northern Lights and to tell his wife what it was like. Well, he just wanted a conversation with you he about wanted, that. He's, to achieve that, you had to go to all these No, you had to, to keep away from all the, the, the hordes and the surrounding. Oh. Awards. It was an emperor yeah. thing, but then in the in the middle of it, he was so thrilled and so complimentary, and it was a sweet man. And much later, when we were filming the film of Ab Fab, we were down in Nice. Um, I got a message from Scorsese to say, "Would I come and see him receiving the Légion d'Honneur?" Um, and I and I wasn't allowed to go. Why? Because I was filming. Oh, Jennifer I Saunders. Know, it, I I mean, know, this is the other side of Jennifer that I don't think so, gets. I, don't, I don't think it was Jennifer. I so think much. it probably what oh what a dreadful woman. He knew you'd gone to see the Northern Lights. That's all part of this phase of your career mm. with these travel shows and, and, and these different things. And now a podcast. With my husband, Joanna and the Maestro, which you very, very sweetly joined us on. I tried to drag it down to my level, yes. This is how it started. At night time we have these sort of this is opening my life to you. Um, at night time, I have a bath, and the, our bathroom door opens into the bedroom. I'm bringing you right into my life. You are. This is Stephen if I'm is there. in bed now reading, and I'm in the bath, and I t- always turn on um, a music station, a classical music station. Sometimes we have, um, you know, uh, France Unique or something like this, which has classical music, or one of the ones from Germany. All classic FM, but classical music comes through. While I'm listening quietly in the bath, I like a bath because I think of everything in the whole day. Quite often I think about you, know, you and what I could say to you, that kind of thing. But I lie in the bath thinking of this. But musical questions come up to me and I shout through and I go, Stevie, how would you, if you had a, a thing, staccato, marked by something, how what figure do you use to move the legato? How would you? And I shout it through to him and he gives me answers. So this and prompted the idea of Joanna and the Maestro, which is that me as every woman, mm. every man, mm. talking to somebody who knows a great deal about music and has done all his because life. Because Stephen is... Because Stephen is a conductor. Right. He's also a composer and yes. a pianist and organist and so on, but, but he's a conductor. But also he, he knows and loves music. And so we started doing things which was really talking about music and... It's interesting to know that a lot of people who are now starved of music in schools, Rob, oh, yes. are at home yes. because, or, or even where we all used to, at school, we used to just sing in assembly mm-hmm. together. No, mm-hmm. no singing anymore. Mm-hmm. And as Welshmen, you must mm-hmm. mourn the loss yes. of the singing. Yes, yes, yes. Um, I mourn the loss of people having to engage in some kind of music which isn't pop music. I think it's important yeah. that we know all kinds of music, including jazz and swing mm-hmm. and whatever big band um, and classical. You can't just have rap music and pop music because that's starving you. Anyway, so we do... You have no do resistance from me. So so the future, mm. what, what... Number one, what do you want? And number two, what do you think realistically will be the future on a work level? Um, realistically, I will be doing another travel programme next year, I believe, and I'm hoping we're waiting for the green light, it will be following the Danube through the 10 or 11 countries that it goes through, mm-hmm. ending up in the Black Sea. So it'll be oh, wow. sort of from the Black Forest to the Black Sea. Mm-hmm. Uh, Joe, it's so lovely. Thank, thank you. you for coming in. Rob, thank you for having me. I've loved being here. I love talking to you. I love, I love listening to you, too. to you. I love admiring you. And I'm now going to go and see your latest film, Barbie. I can think of no better way to end. So why am I still talking? Goodbye. <laughs>